All right. Uh, hello. My name is Andrew Hay. I'm the CISO at Data Gravity. Uh, we're headquartered in Nashua, New Hampshire. Woo. Anyone here from New Hampshire? Five people. <laughs> like right now, you wish you were in New Hampshire? No, no. Just in. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> So this talk, uh, this is the second iteration of a talk that I created, I think it's about three years ago now. Uh, and the reason I had to do a 2.0 is because I don't think many people listened to my 1.0 uh, and implemented some of the suggestions or some of the glaring things that I pointed out. So I'm going to, this talk is really to highlight what has changed, what hasn't changed, what can be better, and uh, hopefully people listen to me this time. So just to give you a little bit of background on me, I am the CISO at Data Gravity. Uh, I've been doing the job since January 4th. I stall there because I had to remember what month it was now. I've been on the road since last Friday. So this is my fifth conference, sorry, fifth talk at my fourth conference in three states over the last seven days. <laughs> So I'm, I'm kind of burnt out. Um, remember that when we're buying drinks tonight. So I used to be the director of research at OpenDNS. I built the research team there uh, up from, I think it was around four people to about 12 uh, when we got acquired by Cisco. I was with Cisco for three months. You can infer what you want from that. <laughs> I was also the Chief Evangelist and Director of Research at Cloud Passage, and that's really where I started doing this talk, was when I was there, because I was, I found myself doing a lot of cloud education, especially around security, because there were so many people that would say, oh, my CFO went to this conference, and they heard about cloud? Have you heard about this thing yet? And we can save all of these money, all of these bags of monies, because people are only paying pennies per hour. Pennies! Of course, that was as much research as they had done, so I had to do a little bit more. I was also an analyst at, an industry analyst at 451 Research, uh, where I helped a lot of companies raise money, of which I've never seen, and uh, get them acquired, which didn't, I got a thank you email every once in a while. Uh, I've also worked in higher education at a university in Western Canada. Yes, I'm Canadian, but do remember how big and tall I am uh, before casting aspersions. And uh, I also worked at a bank in Bermuda, which sounds a lot cooler than it actually was. I uh, was employee 34Q1 Labs, Massachusetts-based company. Uh, I am not a millionaire like the people that stayed with Q1 Labs after the acquisition. Uh, I've written a bunch of books that, judging by my income statements, none of you have read. Uh, I blog occasionally, and I spend an awful lot of time on planes. So that's just a little bit about me. You can learn more, especially the Bermuda style stuff tonight at the, well, after drinks. So what I want to talk about today is a lot of the challenges around cloud and, you know, all jokes aside, cloud security is pretty cloudy uh, or fuzzy at best. I want to talk about some of the existing tools, how they can help, what they can do better. Uh, if anyone's looking for startup ideas, uh, there's a whole bunch at the end of this session. And if how you can use cloud to really do forensic investigation and sorry, incident response activities in cloud environments and how it could be made so much better if we just had the right tools to do the job. Isn't that always the case? So some of the problems with cloud, just calling it cloud, is that there are so many different definitions of cloud. There's private cloud, hybrid cloud, there's different nomenclature across the different cloud platforms. Is it an instance? Is it a guest? Are we talking about SaaS, PaaS, infrastructure as a service? Security as a service, which is a stupid term because it's still SaaS. Um, is it on-prem? Is it off-site? Is it hosted somewhere? Is it multi-tenant, single-tenant? You know, All of these things are cloud of some way, shape, or form. Uh, so it becomes very complicated. So I'm sure you've seen slides like this before, the delineation of responsibility between the different types of cloud platforms. This becomes kind of a problem, not from a deployment perspective, but definitely from a forensics and incident response capability. So if you look at SaaS, you're responsible for the data. 
it's very hard to do anything at the system level in a SaaS environment because it's not your environment. You're provided with what is essentially a web app and a method to put information in and get information out and present it to the end user. There's not a lot you can do if that uh, the guest or instance becomes compromised or the virtual the hypervisor becomes virtualized. You just don't have that visibility. You have a little bit more in platforms as a service environment, uh, but really it's going down to configuration options in code. You're not going to have, you know, most times you're not going to have kernel level, root level access. You're not going to be able to look down into the frameworks used because you're provided with you know, Apache and Postgres. You're provided with the interface to it, but you're not really provided with much other than some of the configuration options. Now, if we look at infrastructure as a service, here's where we're starting to get a little bit more comfortable or more familiar. Uh, but with all of this access, so you're really, you're responsible for the virtual machine container all the way up to the presentation layer. The cloud provider is going to take the hypervisor all the way down to the plugs in the data center. That's their responsibility. But if you start looking at the terms of service for the various cloud providers, you will see very quickly that security is not their main business. So this is from the AWS shared responsibility model. So what I have highlighted is the parts where it says the customer should assume responsibility and management um, of the guest operating system. Uh, you can enhance security if you so choose, which they recommend, uh, with the addition of host-based firewalls, host-based intrusion detection, prevention, encryption, key management, et cetera, et cetera. Things that back on-prem, sorry, I will not say on, yeah, I'll say on-prem. When I say on-prem, I mean on-premises, not on-premise, just in case anyone is like a grammar Nazi. On-prem. Uh, these are things that we would have done on-prem before migrating to cloud environments, right? Or at least we should have done. This is not something that the CFO was told when it's pennies on the dollar to move infrastructure into cloud environments. Now let's take a look at Microsoft. So they tell you data classification and accountability, client and endpoint protection are the responsibilities that are solely in the domain of the customers. So you, you're probably understanding very quickly that these infrastructure as a service providers or these cloud providers are not in the business of providing you with a safe and secure infrastructure within which to operate. They are providing you, just like VMware provides you with a virtualization infrastructure, they're providing you with a method to run machines in a virtualized environment that in some cases is off-prem in public cloud and multi-tenant environment, or it's uh, sorry, off-prem, on-prem, where it's a private cloud infrastructure or, you know, a big ESX deployment, vSphere deployment, whatever. So does anyone here have experience with running virtualization infrastructure? Yeah. What about conducting forensics and incident response activities in those environments? Isn't that fun? So... The delineation is fairly straightforward, but again, when we're talking about cloud forensics and incident response, it can be many different things. Some of these vendors span multiple types of delivery systems, whether it's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. And so if you look at Microsoft, Office 365, the SaaS offering, uh, for platform as a service, I always forget what it's called. Does anyone know? No. See, it's not just me. That's poor marketing. Uh, then they have Azure Cloud, which is the infrastructure as a service model. Uh, AWS, same thing. You can run all of these things very, very easily with a click of a few buttons. Doesn't necessarily mean you should, but it means you can. So there are all sorts of devices that are interfacing or interacting with these various levels in this pyramid, uh, such as mobile devices, uh, physical media, attached storage, whether it's virtualized or a physical appliance shipped to a data center, laptops. But because we don't have eight hours to talk about this, 
Uh, we're just going to focus on infrastructure as a service because it's really the most comparable to having a physical machine in your data center uh, with which to perform forensic analysis and incident response activities on. The other ones you're going to be calling the provider and asking for help. So the five major challenges and the things that we're going to highlight, uh, data residence, which is a big issue, especially if you perform a lot of international business, especially with Europe. Um, physical acquisition of these infrastructure as a service devices uh, and instances slash guests. How to isolate an instance properly. I'll talk a little bit about hypervisor introspection and data integrity. Uh, I should say that you're probably never going to get hypervisor introspection. It would be awesome, but you're not going to get it. And then uh, cloud service provider collaboration and support. And then I'll talk a little bit about some future tech. So if you're conducting, has anyone here ever served in an expert witness capacity or testifying to the validity of data? Um, I have, not for a great case, it was for a child exploitation case. Luckily the guy was insane. He probably got that from the earlier statement, but uh, Knowing where the data is kept along the way adds validity and confidence in your analysis and your presentation of the findings to a court via a report to someone, just your findings. So where is cloud or where is your data stored in the various cloud providers? That's really the big question. You can't just say, yeah, it's, it's in the cloud. Where? Cloud. <laughs> so there's been an evolution in how the various cloud providers have stated that they support or where tell you where your data is stored. So back in 2008, uh, Amazon was saying you can specify where you want to store your data when you create your S3 bucket. Okay, well, that just tells me that at that point, that's where I want, to, I want to specify. It only should be there. Fast forward to 2013. Within that region, your objects are redundantly stored on multiple devices across multiple facilities. Okay, so if my job is incident response and forensics, that's not a good thing to see. If my job is operational IT, this is great, you know, redundancy, resiliency, these are things that I want to see with my data. I want my customers or my constituents to be able to access this information when they need it. As an incident responder, I see this and I get like, I actually did get goosebumps right there, that's kind of weird. Um, that now it's somewhere, and this is where you're like, yeah, it's cloud, it's in the cloud, somewhere in this region in the cloud. Where's the region? Well, based on the map, it's showing the northeast of the United States. So we'll focus our investigation on the northeast, I guess. Most recently, it's been changed to say within that region. And when they say region, they mean like AWS, uh, US East. Does anyone know what big provider runs stuff in US East? One? Or actually, does anyone know where US East is located? Virginia. Virginia. Does anyone know what big provider of video content uses AWS? Netflix. You know when Netflix goes down, there's a whole bunch of other vendors that seem to go down at the same time. I would advise you not run in US East, one, uh, just because if people can't get to Amazon, the odds are that they're probably not gonna to get to you because they're a very resilient and fault tolerant organization. It's usually a data center problem if they go down. Keep that in mind. So within that region, your objects are redundantly stored on multiple devices across multiple facilities, but please refer to the regional products and services for details on Amazon S3 service availability by region. Does anyone know why this last little bit was added? No, nothing happened recently, like Safe Harbor. Yeah, and you'll see a theme here in a moment. So Azure, 2012. 
I actually like this quite a bit. Uh, so they will replicate between two subregions within the same major region for enhanced data durability. That sounds awesome. I want my data to be super durable. Unless I'm doing incident response. 2013, uh, hey, you know what? Customers can choose to disable that feature for the replication. It's not in the uh, documentation anymore. Hmm. So in 2016, uh, each Microsoft Cloud service has its own location policies for customer data. Safe Harbor. Google. So back in 2013, at this time, selection of data center will make no guarantee that project data at rest is kept only in that region. I got to hand it to them. At least they're honest. It's not saying, you know, well, it, it might be moved around here. They're saying, look, you know, we're, we're trying to replicate this. We're trying to get stable. We're still relatively new. It could be anywhere. Deal with it. We're not doing evil. We have a slogan that says so. 2014, hey, that uh, data at rest, it's not in the region anymore. 2016, specific regional information again. Safe Harbor. So now, finding data within a particular region, within a particular provider, is difficult and being able to point your finger and say, I know for example, my data is there. With a physical server, you can walk to the data center and say, you know, I'm 99% sure it is on this Dell server right here or on this storage array. You can't really do that with cloud with any great certainty. And what happens if you're using multiple clouds? Again, data resiliency and data durability. Back four years ago, Five, oh, geez, five years ago, um, there was this idea that people someday would start moving their cloud, or sorry, moving their on-prem workloads to multiple clouds for resiliency. So you would have data shared between Rackspace, AWS, Google, a whole bunch of companies spun up and said that we will help you manage this migration and keep track of the data. And, you know, if one goes down, we'll spin it up over here and... DevOps, DevOps, yay, yay, yay. So that is horrible from an incident response perspective because now you're relying on other tools to figure out where the data may have been moved and then within that region, it could have been replicated somewhere else based on the type of instance that was used. So it's just, it snowballs out of control. So catching a cloud instance is very hard, but you know, a specific cloud is extremely hard. Finding your data on a specific cloud instance. I'll leave it here. Does anyone see Waldo? Right there. Wow, not bad. <laughs> yeah, eagle eyes. You know, I've used that slide for about six years and no one's ever found it. Or they're not paying attention. So, thanks on both fronts. So, physical acquisition of data in cloud infrastructures or of a physical image, extremely difficult unless you own the data center or unless you are running a private cloud infrastructure. Uh, if your name rhymes with Netflix, you may be able to work something out, uh, but you're probably gonna be stuck with logical snapshots. So if you call up to Amazon and say, hey, do you know what? I pay $10 a month. I demand support. You know, I'm one of your biggest customers. I spend $120 a year. They're going to say, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, we don't help you. But if you're spending like hundreds of millions of dollars a year, they may help you a little bit. So the three ways that I know of, of getting data from AWS, and some of this actually does transition uh, or does intersect with some of the other cloud providers, is creating a snapshot of the volume Mount it, copy it. Uh, you can have AWS ship you the data. You'll see why that seems a lot better or sounds better than it actually is. And then you can use software tools to actually compress, encrypt, sign, and download, which sounds pretty awesome. But again, we're talking logical here. So I'll go through this very quickly. You can reference the slides. 
So this is just like performing acquisition on a live system, uh, with the exception of you know you're not moving physical hard drives around, plugging cables in, getting write blockers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So launch an AMI, stop the instance of your target, uh, detach the volume, create a snapshot of that volume, attach the volume to the new AMI, uh, create the EBS volume that is going to be the same size, attach the volume, execute your um, you know, standard file system commands, use DD to make an image. Seems pretty, in, pretty similar. Has anyone had to do this in the past ever? These commands have, are, sorry, this process has kind of been around for the last 15, I'd say even 20 years. That might be pushing it a bit. But this, these steps actually came from Lance at AWS in the user forums. Someone asked the question like, hey, how can I get this? And he's like, oh, well, here are all the steps that I've done. This is an official policy, but this is what I suggest that you try and do. Very helpful. Good work, Amazon. So S3, if you are storing your data in an S3 bucket, you can physically ship a USB drive to Amazon for a $80 per device handling fee and $249 per data loading hour. Uh, so I advise not using a USB 1 hard drive because it could take a while. They will ship it. They'll copy the information and they will physically ship it to you. So at what point does uh, chain of custody <laughs> become a problem when... So in my apartment complex, we have this... You, you always have the shipping people that will say, okay, well, you know, it requires a signature. We won't deliver it unless it requires a signature. Uh, but then it just kind of ends up like thrown on the floor. So no one's signing for it. It's really hard to do chain of custody when you're handing it to a shipper unless they are physically delivering it to you by hand. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is don't ship evidence hard drives to your apartment complex or my apartment complex at least. And we'll, we'll actually get back to this slide in a minute here. Uh, so the AMI tools, this is where you can compress, encrypt, uh, sign, download. This is probably your best bet. It could take a very long time depending on the size of the data. But at least you have compression, encryption, and signing of the data. You can pull it down locally, analyze the snapshot as if you would any other system. So has anyone heard of the Dijkstra-Sherman experiment? So Josiah, Josiah Dijkstra, uh, and I can't, can't remember what Sherman's first name is, uh, or what the T is. Uh, they went as part of, I think it was part of Josiah's uh, PhD thesis. They wanted to go and test all of the tools that are used for forensics and incident response in cloud environments to see how they'd fare. So if you take a look you can see that you know the standard tools, NCASE, FTK, Fast Dump Memorize, uh, FTK Imager, so these are memory things, um, Agent Injection, which is, uh, uh, and then AWS Export. So this bottom one is the shipping of the physical drive. As you can see, the bottom one took 120 hours. So if you're in the midst of an investigation, <laughs> and it's a sensitive investigation, you have nothing but time on your hands. So you can just sit there, twiddle your thumbs, and wait for 120 hours for the data to get to you. It should also be noted that they didn't use a substantial uh, file or collection of files of a substantial or significant size in order to conduct this experiment. We're not talking about like terabytes or petabytes of data. That 120 hours, that could go through the roof very easily. And when people want answers, 120 hours waiting is still way too long. So I, I encourage you to read the, the analysis. It's very, very interesting. Now, hypervisor introspection. Yes? Uh, just live. So you have to do a live uh, capture so you can use memorize or uh, recall. Or... Oh, no, no, they're not going to help you there because those are huge memory pools that would 
because it's a multi-tenant environment, they couldn't explicitly carve out just your data. So hypervisor introspection, this has been around since the days of IDS, where you can passively watch all of the traffic without anyone really knowing. So in terms of a hypervisor, this is cool because you could look at files, you could run all of your tools and the end user would not be aware. On the negative side, uh, you could access these files, run all these tools and the end user would never be aware. So it's very covert, it's very low level, you can access pretty much anything, but on the plus side, it has to be enabled. And you're not going to get this enabled by default. I think for, even for ESX, you have to dig really, really deep to find out how to turn on hypervisor introspection. Uh, if this was implemented by the major cloud providers, which from an incident response perspective would be amazing, uh, you would probably have a ridiculous series of legal battles and class action lawsuits coming as a result. One of the challenges of introspection is proving data integrity. So if you find out, if you're an end user, you find out that hypervisor introspection is enabled, that means that someone could have altered your data and you can just claim like, oh, well, I've been told that introspection was enabled. You can't really prove it's me. It could have been the person who has direct access to the introspection um, engine or visibility. You know, they could have modified, they, they put all that uh, illicit content on my share. It wasn't me. So very hard to prove integrity in that respect, but you're probably not gonna run into that because it's hard to get. Uh, so in terms of Forensic image capture. We have always been told that a physical ma machine that you're investigating, the first thing you do not do is pull the plug, or sorry, pull the ethernet cable. The second thing is you don't power it off. In cloud, we have to throw that completely out the window. So, because you, if you power something off, then you lose all the volatile memory and execution points and anything that's been touched on the system that is deemed volatile. If you do not isolate the instance, then you can't guarantee that it isn't going to continue to be monkeyed with as you're performing your investigation. So what I usually recommend in this case is moving it to a secure, um, so in AWS they're called they call not server groups. Uh, someone say it. Pardon me. Yes, security group. They are security groups. Yeah. So if you move it to a security group that only allows your analyst station access, then you can testify if called to that you were the only one that had the ability to access that machine at that time. And you have to be careful though if you're moving these into. Um, into security groups or behind security groups that other systems are running in, it's very hard to prove that there wasn't some sort of contamination. So if you isolate it, you can say at the time that I conducted my investigation, the instance was located in this region, the data was stored in this region and possibly subregions, depending on how the wording of the, of the uh, documentation is, you can conclude that incoming and outgoing uh, communications, you should be the only one initiating new communications into the machine because it's firewalled off. Outgoing blocking, you're preventing, so if it's part of a command and control session or data is trying to be exfilled, then you've essentially blocked that. So by isolating it, you can make it easier to collect, not contaminate it. You separate it from your production workloads. You're not gonna taint it. It's great. You know, this, this is an ideal situation. It's not hard. Uh, I actually wrote a tool that will do this in AWS, but nobody uses it because it's written in Ruby. 
So most forensics people are uh, hardcore Python zealots, and they make fun of me when I write Ruby. So I'm slowly transitioning the tool over to Ruby, maybe, or sorry, over to Python, create a, um, a UI so that it's kind of point and click, move things around, isolate instances. Um, it's kind of like a poor man's cloud passage, or there's a bunch of other tools that do it now too. But stay tuned for that. So getting support from your cloud provider it's not always that easy, again, unless your company name rhymes with Netflix. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these cloud providers have very, very smart people that are willing to help. But if you are looking to undertake a new cloud project or trying to figure out where you should throw your money from a cloud infrastructure perspective, you need to find out from them what level they are going to exert, how far you have to go after they help you. And at what point are they just going to throw their hands up and say, look, we can't help you anymore. This is beyond our knowledge. The last thing you want to is to be told to email into support and get some first level person who I'm sure is very good at helping with certain things. Uh, forensic image capture and incident response is likely not one of their specialties. So if you can, if you have the clout, you can ask for samples of past investigations, could be obfuscated reports. It's kind of like when you're doing a pen test or you're shopping around for a pen test. You don't want to take the firm at face value. You want to see what they've done in the past to see if they're any good. Uh, you want to see if they're employing methodologies, if they have a documented procedure, or if it's just, hey, we're going to we're gonna see what happens here. Uh, you laugh, but side note, I was on a puddle jumper plane once, twin prop, and we were flying around the airport for about an hour, and the captain came on and said, well, we've been trying to figure out how to fix this, uh, but the flaps aren't working. We don't think we need them to land, so we're going to give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure that wasn't a documented procedure. That was kind of, eh, let's see. Let's see what happens. That's what you want to hear from your pilot. Yeah, we're going to give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah. Asking for the credentials of staff, I don't think that's too much to ask for. Uh, if, and this is a huge if, this is likely never going to happen, but if you can have an interview with some of the cloud service provider team members, that would be great because then you can get confidence as to see if they actually know that there are methodologies that they should be following if they have been involved in any of past investigations that they can talk about so you can get a feel for them it's an interview so it's not all doom and gloom there are a lot of existing tools that can help with cloud incident response and forensic activities uh, they're evolving more and more but one of the big challenges it's not just technical. It's wanting and understanding the need to conduct investigations in cloud environments outside of our comfort zone. So we have been told that you know we need physical systems to perform forensic activities on uh, or a properly sequestered image, whether it be memory or drive, and then only then can we perform our activities. Uh, you're probably not going to get that. You're not going to get physical drives in cloud environments. It's just not possible. Uh, you may have to get very comfortable going forward with storing your investigative images in cloud environments. There's a lot of, a lot of very good ways to sign something, encrypt it, compress it, and then send it up to long-term storage in Amazon Glacier or Azure Blob Storage that you can certify has been untouched because you put it up there following this methodology. Uh, processing things offsite. We are going to see more and more forensics and IR vendors providing SaaS portals to perform the tasks that they only ever did with packaged software before. And uh, launching offsite analysis consoles, 
as much as the big vendors would hate this because they want to sell per seat licensing for you know in perpetuity uh, eventually they're going to be forced to have certain like elastic time regions in order to conduct activities because let's be honest these tools are expensive most times and they, they become shelfware after a while if you don't have a lot of incidents or if you don't have the expertise to conduct the investigations. So I'll give you some free stuff. Uh, NBD server, has anyone used this before? It is a fantastic way to remotely interface with a Windows device uh, and mount, mount the partition as a block device. You can also use volatility and recall to image the memory. Hey. So it's very, very easy. You know, you run the server on the, co on the host that you want to investigate uh, on your client. And there are various clients for Linux uh, and Windows. Just connect to it. And uh, then you can run commands like FLS to start generating a timeline. Simple. So there have been there's active development on these projects. So I actually updated this about 10 minutes ago. Well, sorry, uh, 50 minutes ago. And so the top one, you know, that's the one that I was referencing over here. 16 days ago was the last commit. This one here, if you are using OpenStack, hey, there's an OpenStack object NBD version. Cool for Swift or whatever they're calling it this week. Then there's this one here, Pure Python 2. Latest commit, 29 days ago. I will warn you that the latest commit was actually just fixing the case of a letter, but hey, at least someone cares enough to do that. F response, anyone use F response? So this is an old version, 404. This is the first inclusion of. Uh, any sort of cloud capability. So they did Amazon S3 buckets, HP Rackspace cloud containers, Azure blob storage, let you mount remote systems or remote uh, file objects. In the latest version, as of March, end of March, you can do Amazon S3, blob storage again, Box, Dropbox, Gmail, Google Apps, HP Helion, Rackspace Cloud, Office 365. So at least these guys are making progress. There's not a lot of money to entice them to do this right now. Cloud isn't as lucrative as people would tell you uh, because there's so many, so many data centers still around. So they're, they're kind of playing, they're betting on the long game where this is going to be relevant. It, granted, it's relevant now, but it's not as relevant as data center based investigations or workstation investigations. And you can even spin up an F response instance in the cloud to do this collection so you don't have to do it on your system, which is pretty cool. Uh, does anyone here know Chad Tilbury? Does a lot of sand stuff. Uh, he was a big fan of F response and he kept talking about how it's an ingenious idea. Uh, it's really just using the iSCSI protocol and mounting things. Why, why can't we all do this? So I had this idea. I stood in front of the room and I'm like, you know what? I will give you a link to open iSCSI, the code base. I'll give you the link to the iSCSI org site. Go out and build me a tool so I don't have to pay for F response. And then it was just crickets. No one really cared to help me. Uh, yeah, screw those guys. But... Windows 2008 R2++, uh, iSCSI target you can now create on a Windows server, which is pretty cool because now with any client, and you can, there's actually, this is great, this walkthrough gives you all the PowerShell scripts to set it up on a remote host. So there's really no manual clicking around to do this either. So what you can do is download one of the various iSCSI initiator clients connect to this remote Windows system and do pretty much everything F-Response did, but with free and open source tools. Yay. 
I had no part in any of this, by the way. This is, this is the result of me just waiting long enough for something cool to happen. Uh, anyone use GUR? Yeah. It's great now. In 2011, not so great. Uh, by developers, for developers, uh, it was, I was told that it was deployed within Google on hundreds of thousands of machines. Uh, I, I was being told hundreds of thousands. I think I was told like some artificial number or something. But it allows you to run commands for image capture and to grab information across all of these systems by running a, an activity. Uh, the latest version is a lot more friendly for the non-developer. It's still, you know, very Python-based. It has plugins that allow, uh, allow you to use recall for memory analysis. There's nothing saying you can't run these, uh, these GUR endpoints on your cloud infrastructure. It might just take a little bit longer to pull the information down, but this isn't too bad. So I encourage that you take a look. And by the way, this is developed by the guys at Google. But the G does not stand for Google, for legal reasons. A couple other tools. So people just pointed these out to me. It used to be called WireSpeed. It's now called Evimentary. Um, you can tell, by the way, Analyze is spelled that this is not an American company. There's also Turbinia, made by, uh, well, Corey and and Johan, they presented on it. Uh, I asked Corey for slides. He's like, we don't have any slides. We've, do you have any code? No, we don't have any code that's public. I'm like, okay, so I'll just mention this and you can watch that space. Uh, Brymore Labs, a lot of really cool live forensic capture and incident response tools. You should definitely check those out. So I did say, you know, there's challenges. I gave you some tools. Now this is the future tech. Uh, if anyone has played Civilization, you know what that means. If anyone has wasted years of their lives playing Civilization, you know what that means. So the advantages. So here's where the startup ideas come in. So you can do automated instance isolation. You can do that with a lot of DevOps tools now. There's just a little back-end work that you have to do to actually make that workflow happen. So that's probably, if you're going to build a startup, don't do that one. On-demand forensic workbenches, those are starting to evolve where you click a button and say, I need an, an incident response dashboard to do something and then I want it to go away and I don't want to pay. I want to pay on an hourly basis and not on a yearly basis. We're getting there. Don't do that startup either. Uh, automated timeline generation. This is great. So I'm a big fan of timelines when it comes to forensics and incident response because you can narrow the scope of your research to, or your, your investigation to a certain time period based on when an incident first happened and when it stopped happening and then you can just focus on that little area. Um, if you take some of the tools that uh, the GRR used, so like Plasso, which used to be logged to timeline, uh, and create some wrapper that you can deploy this to all of your running instances, that would be cool, I'd use that. Dynamic analysis workers. One of the biggest challenges that I was told from a forensic forensic analysis perspective uh, was given to me by former NYPD detective. He said that he would go home and he would have a stack of hard drives on his desk this high and he'd get through three of them. He'd go home and he'd come back and there were like six more. It was just a never ending battle and he couldn't retire he set this in his head, like, I'm not retiring until I get through these drives, but you gotta stop giving me new drives, otherwise I can never retire. He's since retired. But a lot of this analysis happens in serial, so it's not a parallel activity. So wouldn't it be cool if you could take multiple drive images, push them up to an engine that would start analyzing things in parallel and then telling you when they were done so that you can start farming that work out to maybe junior people or um, spending time as you need to based on how important that particular investigation is. Same thing with distributed file carving. 
A lot of times, you'll look at a forensic image and you'll say, give me all Microsoft documents. Okay, I got those. Now give me all image files. Now give me this, this, this. And it's it becomes very computationally ex intensive to get that information because you're just trying to extract bits and bytes and turn them into files and dump them somewhere. So why not create this orchestration layer that pushes everything up to cloud and say, okay, this cloud instance does Word docs, this one does Excel, this one does pictures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's gonna cost you a lot less than having a whole bunch of physical systems. And then multi-cloud analysis, this kind of goes with the on-demand workbenches. So if you're, and the workers where if you want to push things to multiple clouds for resiliency, more power to you. I only have a couple slides left, so just ignore. If they look like they're having fun, they're really not. So this is the basis for a lot of forensics and incident response training and knowledge. Uh, very good document, a little bit dated, uh, but you know there, there's only so much you can do. The Cloud Computing Forensic Science Working Group, I was on there for a while, uh, but with most working groups, they move at the speed of NIST. So I'm hoping that the stuff we worked on when that first started, uh, probably be published in the next two or three years, I think. Uh, already irrelevant. That's how working groups work. Here's some links. Um, this is a fantastic resource. It's not updated as much as it should be, but there's a lot of papers, like scientific research papers from that link that you can learn more about the challenges and opportunities of cloud security. Also, watch this space because this is where I'm going to be posting the, uh, the tool suite for isolating your incidents at some point. Bottom line is that it has to be done before uh, DFRWS because I submitted a talk there and if it gets accepted, I'm screwed if the code's not complete. So that, I, I've got a forcing function there. So just to summarize, cloud forensics and IR, you have to have an open mind when you're talking about cloud. Uh, you can't think of the brick and mortar data centers and the work, the physical servers and having the device in your hand. That's just not the case anymore. Uh, you can use cloud, use the advantages offered by cloud to conduct investigations. Uh, and the tools, though they are evolving slowly, need to continue to evolve. And again, there's not a lot of money in cloud from a forensics point of view. It, does anyone know the proportion of, of revenue uh, for like a guidance software or access data, how much of that goes to e-discovery versus forensics? It's like a 90-10 split. E-discovery pays the bills. 10% of the forensics is the cool stuff that I care about. They don't make a lot of money on that. So with that, uh, if you wanna email me, follow me on Twitter. Uh, I tweet a lot of inane stuff. I'm gonna be around for the rest of the day. All right, thank you very much.